there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. I have something new for you guys today, underhyped, underappreciated books. These are books that I loved, but no one else seems to know about, and I want to fix that. So I went through my Goodreads and I gave myself some criteria. They had to be books that I rated 4 or 5 stars and have less than 1,000 ratings on Goodreads. Not reviews, there's always fewer reviews, but star ratings. I narrowed it down to 6 books to introduce to you guys today with my usual all over the place kind of style. Fiction, there's medical, non-fiction, there's regular old non-fiction, there's romance, there's a YA book, all kinds of stuff, so let's get right into it. Going in order for books that have the least amount of ratings, up, the first with only 41 ratings, gah, is Committed, The Battle Over Involuntary Psychiatric Care by Dinah Miller and Annette Hansen. Involuntary care is a big old bag of ethical conundrums because there's so many things that go into it. Because what it is, is you are deciding somehow that someone is a danger to themselves or a danger to other people because of their mental state. Uh, some mental, some disease or some disability or something, and you take away their freedom by locking them up in a hospital. So who decides that? How do they decide that? How do you know you're not making a mistake? Is an inpatient program really the best thing? Some people are against involuntary care whatsoever. If the person doesn't want it, how can you force them to have it? Maybe an outpatient program is the best way. Uh, how, what happens when these uh, people interact with police? And how does that get dealt with? Just so much stuff. Hansen and Miller are psychiatrists, but they do an amazing job looking at the whole spectrum of issues and options. They talk to people who are very pro-psychiatry and very pro-medication and helping people out through involuntary care to the exact opposite. People are completely anti-psychiatry, anti-medicine, who don't believe in any kind of care at all. They even got a Scientologist to talk with them. That takes skill. They also talk to officials who are involved in the civil commitment process, lawyers, ER doctors, anyone and everyone who's involved. The narrative is loosely structured based on two patients, one of whom had a good experience in involuntary care and another one who did not have a good experience and that's how they touch on all these conundrums. And like some things, they own up when they can't get into an issue as much as they want. For example, guns and mental health is a big issue and they tried to speak to pro-gun advocates and tried to get their view on things, but they wouldn't even talk to these doctors unless the doctors promised they were anti-gun control. And when the doctor said, look, we don't care about gun control. We're here for mental health. It doesn't matter either way to us. They still wouldn't talk to them. And whenever I found like a hole or a weird bit in their reporting, it was explained in this way. They own all of that. And I think that makes this very strong as a scientific work, as a well-researched work. I like this book because it's fascinating. It brings up bunches of issues that I had kind of sort of known, but never really thought about. And because the laws and things dealing with involuntary care are so varied, across jurisdictions, across states, across countries, they don't tailor this to any particular place. It's more of a framework so that you can evaluate the laws wherever you are and decide whether you like them or not or agree with them or not. If you have an interest in mental illness, civil rights, if you've always wanted to know what happens in these kinds of situations, this is a great book for you. Next, with 44 ratings, is Charleston Syllabus edited by Chad Williams, Kadata Williams, and Keisha Blaine. I originally received this as an advanced copy, and actually I think I got committed as an advanced copy too, just full disclosure. It seems like so long ago, but in Charleston there was a shooting where a young white male went into a predominantly black church and shot and killed a group of people in a prayer group, and this is shocking and horrifying, and it left a lot of people who don't know a lot, about race relations in America, going, how could this happen? Why could this happen? And the editors of this book on Twitter started a hashtag called Charleston Syllabus. And they brought together all kinds of books, documents, first person accounts in a list. It's like, if you want to know more of how we got to this point, here's a history of African Americans in America. Have at. It's a wonderful list. I will leave a link to it down below. But it is long. I mean, these are all mostly full-length works, full-length books, and if you're looking to get a, a grasp on the situation, it would take a lot of reading to get there. 
that's what this book is here for. The book is divided into six chapters that cover everything from slavery and religion to Malcolm X and Black Lives Matter. Each chapter starts with a historical overview and then turns over to first-person accounts, scholarly analysis, articles from the days and weeks after the shooting. The theme holds the chapter together and it allows you to draw parallels and see how thoughts regarding whatever it is came through time. So there might be a first-person account of a slave and it will be right next to the text of a song that slaves would sing at that time, followed by scholarly analysis of what this meant for whatever, and that made it a really great overview. This book filled in so many holes in my knowledge and made me question my education even more. Why haven't I seen an annotated constitution of the Confederate States? Why have, didn't I know about uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was the most kick-ass investigative reporter? And reading all of these different accounts, this huge wide range of material helped me focus in on periods and people that I would like to read more about. The most valuable thing though is that reading this book really gave me an overview on how African Americans have been treated from the beginning and carried through to today is really why we are where we are now and that it's not a surprise, and that this violence is not out of nowhere, but deeply grounded in our past. And only by understanding that past do we have a chance at changing things in the future. It was incredibly powerful that way. If you like history, if you like first-person accounts and narratives and documents, if you want a better grasp on, you know, racial relations in the United States, whether you're from the U.S. or not, I think this is a great place to start. Don't worry, we're getting lighter from here. Next we have a book that was before its time. It's Night Calls by Katherine Aliska Kimbrell. It is the beginning of a series that today would be called YA. It came out in 1996. I can tell you from personal experience, YA books were not a thing back then. And the original cover looked like horror, but it has elements of fantasy and kind of paranormal, but with an alternate history. It's this weird combination of stuff that at the time marketers couldn't figure out what to do with, but today would have a definite place on that YA shelf. The one line description is it feels like little house in the big woods with werewolves and vampires in an alternate early 1800s Michigan territory. The main character is a girl growing up in the woods with her family and her extended family and she doesn't know it, but she has magical powers, and these are quite something and run through her family when they start to manifest her relatives and everyone try and figure out the best way to train her, and it's like kind of like witchy kind of skills. And it's her coming-of-age story while fighting against werewolves and vampires, going on perilous trips through the woods, and it's a three-book series that we follow her through. And I loved it. Some people may find it slightly slow, but for me, I enjoyed the process of it, seeing what this world is like. And when I say it's an alternate history of Michigan territory, it's not just the paranormal elements. There's a King Washington. Either I think he's on the throne or he recently gave up the throne. And all of this other kind of background stuff going on, but it very much follows her on her coming of age journey with the magic. And I, Wish I could explain it better for you guys, but it is awesome. After that, with 682 ratings, we have Love Marriage by Vivi Ganeshanathan. If you follow bookish podcasts, you may know the podcast Fiction Nonfiction, and Ganeshanathan is one of the hosts of that. This book is a lyrical telling of a family's diaspora experience. They are Tamil, Sri Lankan, and they flee from Sri Lanka after the Black July riots of 1983. And this family ends up in Canada, and the story follows the daughter of these immigrants and how she's learning about and coming to terms with her family's history. She gets called back home to help her uncle, who is very much unwell. He is a former Tamil Tiger, which is a militant group, and from him and from being around family, she learns more about what they went through, and she's also watching her cousin uh, enter an arranged marriage. and what she thinks about that, because she grew up in Canada, she's more of a modern girl, and the tension between those points of the traditional and the modern, which I feel like is a real, 
It's cliched in immigrant fiction, but this did not feel cliched for me, mostly because it deals a lot with this war that happened between the Sinhalese and Tamil in Sri Lanka. And if you don't know anything about it, I think this is a good place to start. Obviously, you're following a Tamil family that has been forced to flee, but at the same time, Ganeshanathan lets you know that everyone in the war thought they were doing the right thing. It's just that people had different definitions of what's right. This book really struck a personal chord for me because one of my best friends in college was Sri Lankan, born in Sri Lanka, and also fled. So there was all different kinds of parallels I could see. It helped me understand what her experience must have been like. And it's really enlightening in a bunch of ways with beautiful writing and an interesting story. Next is some more fiction. It's Seeing Red by Lena Miruane, and I feel so bad that I've been mispronouncing her name. I haven't talked about her too much on this channel, but I butchered the name and I'm so sorry. It's Miruane. It's a semi-autobiographical novel, which is a weird space, I know, and it's not my business to ask how much of this is the author's experience, but the character's name is also Lena, and she is diabetic, and she has been told that if she moves her head a bit too violently, the veins in the back of her eye, in the retina, will burst and make her blind. And guess what? That happens. Lena, like the author, is Chilean and has moved to New York and got a new boyfriend recently. And this going blind thing happens and changes everything. The new boyfriend ends up having to be a care caretaker because Lena has no experience being blind. She doesn't know how to do anything. She can't even draw up her own insulin. She needs help to do almost everything. She's counting steps to make sure she doesn't bump into walls. Her boyfriend makes sure that she stays on the sidewalk and doesn't venture out into the street. All these adjustments that she's making to her life, and she's hoping this will be temporary, and she's going to the doctor, but who knows? And her parents back home in Chile are freaking out and running up her phone bill. It's a first person narrative, so after Lena goes blind, part of your sight is taken away as well and scenes like waiting in a doctor's waiting room instead of seeing the art on the wall or whatever she talks about hearing the shuffling feet of somebody going to the bathroom or the sigh as somebody flops into a dilapidated chair and the images and the writing drew me right through until the end and ooh, it was chilly and the ending just took my breath away and the last book I have on this list is Rush by Gina Gordon because I can't let us go by without a romance. Some people might call this new adult, but it's kind of on the older upper edge of new adult, if you ask me. Everly is in her last year of law school and trying to figure out what she wants to do after she graduates. Max is the heir to a porn empire, but not a sleazy porn empire. This is a respectable porn company. Just gotta trust me on this one, it works. They meet he asks her out on a date and for reasons she decides to go out of her comfort zone and accept. The strength of this story for me is the path that their relationship takes. It's very believable, it's very realistic, and things that should have an influence do. They both are being pressured on the outside to do certain things with their life, even if that's not exactly what they want to do. And this whole idea of Max having basically grown up around porn affects what Everly thinks the relationship is going to be like and how it may actually evolve or not. And I thought that was really well thought out. Like, yeah, dating somebody who knows a lot of porn would be weird for a while there until you learn about each other. I loved it even though it's not in my wheelhouse, which is my one of my definitions for a four star read. If you're looking for some romance that in addition to being a slow burn and being hot, something a little bit more unusual and where the journey matters just as much as anything, this is a great book for you. So there we have it, a bunch of underhyped, underappreciated books that I have not seen around booktube. So if you have read any of these, do let me know because you and I are a rare pair. And if you would like to read them now, just want to say hi, I would love that. Let's have a gab down in the comments. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new and I will see you in the next video. Bye.